In this video, we're going to discuss the failure of classical mechanics. Now, this unit is the beginning of us switching gears a little bit and starting to talk more in depth about atomic structure. We've already introduced the atom. Atoms have played a big role in talking about chemical reactions. They're the building blocks of molecules. Molecules participate in reactions. We've talked about this a lot, so you have an appreciation at this point for why the atom is important, but at this point, we wanna take a bit of a deeper dive into the structure of the atom. Earlier in, this, in the course, we talked about some of the early experiments to, to kind of elucidate the subatomic particles that exist in atoms, the protons, neutrons, and electrons, in this unit, we're really going to focus primarily on the electrons. And the reason why, um, I love this quote by Bill Bryson, um, who's an author who wrote a really good popular science book called the, the, A Short uh, History of Nearly Everything. And what he said is protons give an atom its identity, electrons its personality. What you'll come to have an appreciation for in this unit is that even though you can identify an atom based on how many protons it has, its properties are going to vary wildly based on the number of electrons that it has, right? Uh, we've already talked about ions, right? So you can have a single atom. It's going to be a little bit different whether it has, um, whether it has a plus one charge, plus two charge, or a negative charge, right? So the charge on the atom is going to change its properties. But even more so than that, um, certain prop, certain um, atoms that have similar electronic structures via the number of electrons they have are going to be very similar in the, the properties that they exhibit. So, um, so I feel like this quote perfectly captures um, how atomic structure is dictated by the subatomic particles. Now, why do we care about classical mechanics? This is physics stuff. So why is this uh, coming into our chemistry conversation here? Well, it turns out that the classical physics, the Newtonian mechanics that you can use to describe some problem like a, a block sliding down an incline or even to explain why a rocket can propel into space or something like that, that type of physics is actually not sufficient to describe something as small as an electron, right? So we've talked about these electrons as really small subatomic particles. Uh, Newtonian physics, classical physics, is insufficient to describe electrons. Now, if you look at this figure here, this is a very popular, uh, what we call a planetary model of the atom, right? So basically you envision the atom as a cluster of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, and that the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus in these well-defined orbits, right? This is actually a really poor description of the atomic structure. And I hope that at, through this unit, you'll have an appreciation as to why this is a poor description of the atom. And we'll kind of talk about that here, why classical mechanics fails um, to describe this accurately on its own, right? So first, let's talk about why this might be a feasible model for the atom. Right? And, and to do this, we kind of got to take a trip back in time, right? Back into the 1800s when classical physics was the only physics around. And one of the biggest achievements of classical physics at the time, one of the biggest achievements of classical mechanics was to be able to figure out the orbit of the Earth around the sun, right? First figuring out that the Earth orbits the sun and then being able to figure out um, and, and predict how that orbit occurs was one of the biggest achievements of classical mechanics in the 1800s. So, um, so if we think about a planetary model, right, the, the actual model of the planets, right, or just of Earth, right, orbiting the sun. So you'll have the sun and we'll have Earth somewhere outside, right? And the Earth will be orbiting the sun, right? There'll be some orbit here. Right? And the Earth is going to orbit around the sun in this, you know, well-defined pattern based on the attraction between the sun and the Earth, right? The gravitational pull, right? So we know that the gravitational force for the Earth orbiting the sun, right, follows the following, um, the following equation, right? So you have the force of gravity, 
is going to be proportional to the mass of object one times the mass of object two over the distance between the two, right? So that R uh, in the denominator, right, R squared, this is just the distance between the two objects, right? So you'll have R, the distance between them. This is the gravitational force between the Earth and the sun. Now, question, why does, if there's this gravitational force that's pulling the Earth towards the sun, why is it that the earth does not fall into the sun, right? Why, why does it maintain this orbit around the sun and, and doesn't succumb to that gravitational pull of the sun and, and gets pulled into the sun? Well, the reason why is that there's a counterbalancing force to that gravitational pull, right? So if, if that's the distance between the two, we know that there's going to be a gravitational pull, right? So this is the force of gravity right, that's, that's attracting the earth to the sun, there's actually a counterbalancing force that we call the centrifugal force, right, that's going in the opposite direction. So this is called the centrifugal force. That counterbalances that gravitational force between the earth and the sun, and that's what prevents the earth from falling into the sun and, and staying on this relatively predictable orbit that classical mechanics has mastered, right? So in the 1800s, right, once, um, you know, Dalton's atomic theory was, was circulating and people more or less, you know, believed in atoms, right? Um, looking, it was natural for them to want to kind of investigate what this subatomic structure looked like and how we could predict it. And basic, basing the, uh, the, the atomic structure on this planetary structure seemed like a safe bet. At that time, they already knew that there was a cluster of subatomic particles in the center and that the electrons were on the outskirts of that nucleus, right? So they basically built a very similar model, right? So if we think about the atom model, right, there's a nucleus in the center, right? So I'll put a positive charge on that guy, have a nucleus in the center. And then on the outskirts, we got the electron, put a negative charge there. And basically what early, uh, early atomic structure theorists looked at was, okay, let's envision that we've got some sort of orbit here as well, right? And that um, it would have a similar sort of orbit to the earth orbiting the sun, right? It would just travel along in this orbit around the nucleus, this well-defined orbit, right? Um, this was useful because um, the, the force that attracts these subatomic particles, right, the electron and the nuclei, have a very similar uh, mathematical model to the gravitational force, right? It's something called the Coulombic force, Right, so you'll have a Coulombic attraction between the nucleus and the electron, right? And so it'll be proportional to something that'll look very similar to this gravitational force equation. Basically, you'll have Q1, which will be the charge on object one, and Q2, the charge on the second object, over R squared, the distance between the two. Well, these, these equations look very similar, right? So it, it makes sense that they reason that, okay, this, they must follow similar physics, right? So if we think about this in the same way, right, there's some Coulombic force here, right, that's attracting the positively charged nucleus to the negatively charged electron. And they were like, okay, well, must have some similar centrifugal force that's acting in the opposite direction and keeping it in that orbit, right? However, there's one key difference between charged particles in motion that, you know, planetary bodies don't have to deal with. And that, that caveat is electromagnetic radiation, right? So if I, I kind of redraw this uh, orbit here, right? So if we have a, a positive charge there, and we have our electron orbiting around, right? As this electron is in motion, right? So let's kind of start its orbit a little bit, right? So we got the start of its orbit. As a charged particle is in motion, what happens is 
it's going to emit electromagnetic radiation, right? Which electromagnetic radiation is basically like light, like energy from light, right? Um, it's emitting that electromagnetic radiation. So I'm going to put that as, you know, these waves that are coming off of the electron, right? This is it emitting electromagnetic radiation. So I'll say EMAG radiation. Right, so it's emitting electromagnetic radiation. What that means is that as the electron is orbiting the nucleus, it's actually losing energy. What that's gonna do is make that Coulombic attraction to the nucleus much, much stronger, right? So what's gonna happen is that, okay, if it's orbiting around, as it's losing energy, it's going to get a little bit closer to the nucleus and each revolution is just going to keep getting closer and closer and closer to the nucleus until it collapses into the nucleus, right? This is a phenomenon known as the electron death spiral, right? So we call this the electron death spiral. And it may sound rather dramatic, but that's only because this would be a dramatic phenomena if this was accurate, right? If this was accurate, then the, uh, any atom would only exist for about five times 10 to the negative 11 seconds, right? That's, that's how long an atom would exist if this physics was accurate to describe atoms, right? It would only last for a blip in time. So clearly, because of this, you know, more or less ridiculous result that we get when applying classical mechanics to a problem of, um, of you know, subatomic physics, we end up with a result that doesn't make sense. So clearly classical mechanics is insufficient to describe these types of problems. So what was necessary was to come up with a new physics to describe these types of problems. That physics was called quantum mechanics, or I should say is called quantum mechanics, right? And quantum mechanics is essentially just the physics of really, really small particles. And an electron fits in that category. And quantum mechanics is able to accurately describe the, um, the motion of the electron around a nucleus um, able to describe the properties of the electron in a more accurate way compared to what you get from classical mechanics. So in this unit, in the next couple of videos, what we're going to do is really look at um, electromagnetic radiation, right? This uh, phenomenon of electromagnetic radiation is something that you typically cover in introductory physics, but we're going to give a little bit of an introduction here so that everyone is familiar. Um, and from there, we'll talk about a few really specific failures of classical mechanics that came up in experiments in the early 1900s and from there start to talk about how we can uh, develop quantum mechanics and what properties it can give us about the electron.